Actually, I'm going to start like this. Okay, ready? We're rolling? Are you good? So. <laughs> so dumb. You know how it starts like boom, 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 and then the, the beat drops more? Oh, my muchkele, muchkele. Make a funny. <laughs> <laughs> What is it, what is it? Jokes aside, man. Hi, school. Jokes aside. My name is Nadiv. Welcome to my podcast. I welcome you to another episode of my podcast, Jokes Aside. I am your host. Tell, tell them, Lorenzo, who are you here with? I am with uh, Nadiv Monjo, my very, very close friend. And I'm very happy you are my host today on this cold Wednesday morning. Cold winter day. Um, you welcome in your beautiful apartment. I appreciate it. Uh, and I should introduce you as much as I want this episode to be about me. Mm -hmm. It's not. <laughs> no. We'll see. I'll try to sneak in a lot of me in there. Please do. Find the moments for me. Because ultimately this is a way for me to shine. I know. Okay. You always use me, actually. Yeah, I do. <laughs> Please welcome Lorenzo Viotti, or as I like to call him, my good friend, Lore. Oh! <laughs> um, thank you so much for being here. Uh, how does one even introduce you? You are a world-renowned conductor, a train conductor. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You do the choo-choo. I do the choo-choo with Marcello. <laughs> you do the choo-choo with Marcello, our good friend. Um, you're a classical music conductor. You are a fashion icon at this point. Um, you're a wonderful human being, a loyal friend, and a beautiful soul. Thank you for being here. Lorenzo Viotti. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Only because of the times we're in, we don't have the thousand people in the audience today. Yeah. So I'm going to take you back to the beginning, mm -hmm. how it all started. With you hatched out of a golden egg, clearly. Mm. Pretty, yeah. A very, a very beautiful one, let's say, in Switzerland. Then moved to France from, with an Italian, French-Italian family. So, yeah, we were... I. I don't say me because, you know, my, my brother and my sisters, we were raised, um, a bit like you in a family where values, family values, um, matter. So I think that's the best part of our education. We were raised with this beautiful, um, beautiful things, not rules, but like there's a couple of things that matters in life, which is like, um, friends, family, passion, freedom. So our parents just g gave us always the freedom to choose what we wanted without giving us pressure. And I think it's a bit like you, you know, you came from a family of a very creative person. Your dad was, uh, was let's say, an institution at this time, but you never felt like the, the shadow of him or something. They, they always gave you, you traveled with them. It's the same with us. We traveled with my parents all around the world. And, you know, when I said I want to play drums which was not maybe the best instruments comparing, you know, symphonic orchestra, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, yeah, my dad like supported me so much and uh, went to all of my concerts. So it was, um, it was an incredible childhood, which also like continue even when my father passed away because my mom just, you know, continued that and literally saved us. You know, we were all in, in difficult ages. And she just gave us all a different um, education, very personal, because she knew, okay, I need maybe more freedom. Uh, my sister needs maybe less. Um, and yeah, my, my, my life really started, I think, as a man in Vienna when I, when I moved here 10 years ago, 11 years ago, to be, to be precise, when I met all of you guys. Exactly. I'll never forget it. We met in a... I think we met in a club. Um, and um, yeah, I, I guess there's so many things to cover. I, I think that going back to childhood a little bit, what 
you said, you know, you started with drums and, and now you do something else. I mean, I think that you still, for fun, you like to work on all these passions that you have. But was there a specific moment where you felt, ah, like I'm inspired to become a conductor? I'm inspired to now switch lanes and, and do, let's say, what your, what your father, you know, used to do. I was always fascinating by that as a child, you know, when you go as, as a kid to the opera, you can fall asleep very easily mm -hmm. because also music is a kind of, um, can really, you know, balance you and put you in a very comfort zone and you fall asleep. I still fall asleep sometimes when I go to the opera. It's like, really, really, absolutely. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Not when I conduct, fortunately, <laughs> that but when be. I listen, sometimes you're just touched in a way that it's okay to fall asleep. And I say to, to my audience, I say, don't worry, don't be, you know, also like um, scared to do that in front of someone else, which is not sleeping. You know, it's, it can happen. It's totally normal. It's, it's a proof that music is touching you in a special way. So I never, as a kid, never fell asleep because I was fascinating by this theater, you know, by this world of, of creativity, of unreality. Do you know my first shock as a child at the opera? It was to see someone dying on stage and to see him alive backstage. And you know, when you're a child, you, you, you don't know, you don't realize this is a play, this is everything fake, but you see blood, you see an execution, an execution on stage live. And then you see the same person like walking to you, like hugging my dad and so, and you're like, and I was crying so much wow. and I was like, wow. So you can play with life and death here. You can invent, you can play a role, um, the costume, you know, you can play like 200 years ago, you can uh, play with lights, um, you can like be supported by a musical line. So all those things, not only conducting, was like, what is this world, you know? And uh, obviously as a child, you have no idea about, you have dreams, uh, aspiration, but I don't believe you know exactly what you want to do. Mm. Um, and for me, I was always very, very disciplined and serious when it comes to my passion. Mm -hmm. There was, you know, it's a fact. I never took it just not seriously. Um, and that was maybe already the difference with other, other kids of my age that, you know, enjoy really much, you know, chilling and stuff like that. For me, it was clear if I want to do that in my life, I need to work harder than the other. Mm -hmm. um, do you think um, there's, there's a couple of things. One, you talk about the effect you had as a child watching mm -hmm. a performer die on stage and then seeing him backstage alive and well. When you do your music, do you do it for the audience? Do you want to do it that so some other young person in the audience or it doesn't matter what generation, but that they have a similar effect, that they're <gasps> wowed by, by the music that you conduct and, and, the, and that the orchestra plays? Or is it more you're doing it for, let's say, your own reasons, for selfish reasons, to say, I, I need this in my life. I want to feel something. Is it a combination? It's, it's sometimes I ask myself the same thing as an actor. Like, am I doing it for me? Or am I doing it because I want someone to experience something that I'm doing on stage so that they can have it, they don't have to do it in their real life, but they can experience this feeling in the audience. I think both are related. You can't be 100% um, generous with the other if you didn't reach like a, a, a state of complete balance with yourself. So it's, um, if it's not a necessity for you um, to be where you are, um, you can't transmit because I think it's about transmission. It's only about that as an actor, as a musician, as a painter. It's um, if you do that to please yourself, then you chose the wrong, um, you, the wrong profession. Mm -hmm. Because first, I think it's uh, too narrow minded to think like that. And then you can't lie to the audience. If you do that for yourself, they will never buy it, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so if it's natural from you, you have this um, you can call it as you want, Ausstrahlung or charisma that envelop everyone. You know, it's, it's just, you arrive on stage and they already know the generosity and is un, mm -hmm. unlimited. So, um, but you need 
you need a lot of, of let's say, preparation to arrive at this point, you know? For me, I needed to be very selfish first to, to realize that now it's time to give back. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's like in personal life, you know, to be able to, to love unconditionally, you need to know exactly who you are and to, yeah, to love yourself as we, we both know this situation. And it's the same with our profession. It's, it's so delicate. It's so fragile. You know, I, twice in the past years, I almost stopped my profession because I got hurt very deeply about the reality of our business as well, that it can be fake people around you. What people expect is just very superficial. And when you give all your soul and time and energy into that, and you realize that also the public, you know, that they didn't realize how bad was this, this evening and they still give you a standing ovation. You think like, why am I doing that? You know, what is the, what is the goal of it? Right. And then you have to realize, okay, I think, there is a huge change at the moment in, in our life. Also, thanks to what is happening, thanks to the pandemic, uh, the normality that um, was in our life before the pandemic, I think, cannot happen again. You know, people are, are, are saying like, to, when are we going to back to our normality? I think it was toxic because in many types of art, um, it started to be very, very superficial and we lost depth and very, it became very individual. Even if you think like classical music is always the elite, you know, very high up, it's wrong, you know, big famous music institution, because it's so a luxury, such a bubble, just, you know, continue to do as they was doing like 20, 30, 40 years ago, because it's a tradition, because we have our public without thinking outside the box. Mm -hmm. And I think our role today, especially as conductor, is not anymore to just, you know, do beautiful music on stage, but is actively to open doors, to invite diversity into our world, to invite the new generation, which is completely lost, I think, really. And I'm part of it in a way. I'm, I'm lucky. But if I see around myself, people are always trying to build themselves and not to be themselves yeah you know? yes yes and they're trying to show rather than be i think it's exactly. it's this thing of you you put you know I, I, the only way i can sort of relate to it on a i mean on a personal level i completely agree with you also that you have to truly go on this self-reflective journey of finding yourself i know that sounds oversimplified to say finding yourself but what it means to me is you have you feel full. You're, you're, you're sunken in, you're a little bit more grounded. Um, I think that in your industry, perhaps in my industry, there is this excuse to run away, to play a character, to play something else so that we can experience other things that maybe in our real life we might not have. But for me, it's, it's, it's like same as when you take it into the personal, whether it be a friendship or a relationship, you really have to be full person before you can give to someone else, yeah. you know, um, this whole fairy tale, you know, thing of your, my, a friend of mine posted this the other day on, on Instagram. He said, happy birthday to my other half. You fulfill me, you know? Um, and I, as romantic as that sounds, I disagree. It's two fools have to come together as much as possible, you know, because if you're relying on the other person to just give you that and, and you're feeding off of it, what happens if the other person is suddenly not happy or is suddenly in a place where they don't know where they are, who they are anymore, and you have to just like, I don't know, try to turn them into you. So the more full you are, I think the, the, the better and the more grounded you are as a person and you're able to, to really make a functioning relationship. And I think it's the same thing with work. You know, for me as an actor, I used to try to really almost force out a feeling. I said, it doesn't matter where I am in my life. I'm just going to try to play this character. And now more and more, also the more I work with my father, he really says, just be, you are already special. You don't have to try hard. You don't have to do much. You don't have to 
prove to them that you are somebody, you know, when you feel something, you feel something. Like you said, it's the audience will read past that immediately, you know? And I think, in a, you know, we, we know each other now since, since 11 years. Um, I think to detach yourself from, I mean, to be honest, family pressure mm -hmm. in both of our case um, was not easy. Even if from outside, it looks very liberal, very open, you know, blah, blah, blah. I think um, for me it was a bit different because I, my father was not anymore alive, but his, um, his legacy was extraordinarily beautiful. You know, everyone loves, loved and still loves my dad. Mm -hmm. And that was the most beautiful gift um, as, a, as a child, as a teenager and as a, as a man. I'm extremely proud to be to be his son and to hear always how much he was uh, he was loved. But it was it was uh, it was difficult because of course, unconsciously you 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 fight a bit um, with it. Mm -hmm. And I think in your case, when I see the bit the, the evolution of of you as a uh, as a man, I finally realized to see that you start to to go now on your own path because you have famous, successful brothers, mother, dad, and to do your own way in a way with the support of them, but who can be also like kind of even more pressure, you know, it's, it must be, and it was, I know, very, very difficult. And especially I think Vienna can be, uh, a beautiful prison mm, for that. Cage. For that, because uh, you know everyone, everyone knows you, and even if everyone says, you know, there is no pressure, there is pressure, there is expectation, because um, sometimes to be part of a community can be toxic, and uh, you lose the actually is the the possibility to be your own self. Right. Even if you are strong and stuff like that, you know, it's, it's, it's so I'm happy to see actually that even if when we talk now, that it's, it's different, you become much more you and uh, the person I could feel in some lapse of the time through the past years, I think you, you lived also some very tough moments in the, the, those past months that actually made you realize if I spend also a lot of time by myself, who I'm gonna I'm gonna rise as Nadiv and not as someone who is like trying to be someone else. I never asked myself and felt the desire to be someone else because um, because I, I'm really accepting who I am. So I cannot answer that question. Appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, I think sometimes you have to go through what's that cheesy line? You go through the rain. You have to deal with some rain before you get to the rainbow. I think um, it's true, though. It's it's very cheesy. It's very cheesy. But you know what? I'm a cheese man. And when you said, you know, like you've become a stronger individual, the first thing that popped up into my head was the song, What Doesn't Kill You Makes You Stronger. But then I was like, Don't sing it because it's a serious moment. Yeah, you just killed it. And I just killed it. Right. And forever it will be. Uh, this is your quality. You know? <laughs> you know, this is not, not to kill the moment, but always to. Um, actually, this is interesting because actually, when, he talks about, when we talk about seriosity, um, I realize by spending a lot of time with our group of friends mm. um, that sometimes people are running away from those moments of intensity yeah. by using humor. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah, which is a, a gift. It's a it's a gift that you have, but sometimes it's okay, it's okay to stay in this in that intensity. Yes, and, and I think and in a, in our group of friends, sometimes it's a it's a bit of pity that. Uh, but at the end, you know, blah blah blah. We we, we escape because we don't want no, to, of course, to be too deep. <clears throat> yeah. And I think that it's also like a pressure. Talk about pressure. Like for me, as the I'm often seen as the comedian of the group, and I feel a sense of pressure that I have to make people either laugh or I want to make them happy when they're sad. I want to show them that 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 light. But 
I've been practicing really this year, I have to say, and, and you're right, like I've dealt with some personal um, things that, that were emotionally quite, yeah, um, heavy, uh, that, that how important it is to stay in the moment, to really invite the, the feeling of grief or sadness or, or heartbreak. Um, and then, you know, like what's important is to not dwell on it. Like I had a phase in the summer where for the first time in my life, I was suddenly shocked at the fact that I was going through a feeling of depression. Me, Mr. 99% positive. You know, I was like, how, how is this possible? But as soon as you say out loud, oh, I'm not happy, I instantly became happier. And I knew I'm not the type of person that will sit in bed and not be able to get up for weeks and weeks and weeks. So I knew the moment would come that I would anyway pick myself back up and then use humor and use, you know, motivation and, and, and positivity. But because of that, I said, how important is this phase for me? How important is it to stay sad, <laughs> to, to face it, you know, to really take a deep look in the mirror, to accept it. And then it also like, it's, it's all part of it, right? It makes you a stronger person. It makes you a better artist, I think. Um, and, and I feel, yeah, it, it really is so important who you surround yourself with. I, and both of us are very blessed that we have amazing friends. Mm. And they all do very different things, right? We have some that are in restaurant business, some that do finance, some that are artists. But um, it was always an escape for me. And it was nice because it kept me humble. It kept me balanced. And it was interesting that none of them were actors mm. because I felt, A, unique in the circumstance, but also it was nice to not always have to talk about it. On the other hand, I recently realized how important it is to surround yourself sometimes outside of your comfort zone with people that challenge you within your field, within your industry, inspire you. So and so that's what I did. I said, look, I love all of my friends here in Vienna, but I need to branch out. I need to spend time in Berlin. I need to spend time in LA again. I need to meet other actors and see, recognize some of myself in them to not think that I'm crazy. You know, wow, they have these thoughts. They have these insecurities. They have these challenges. How is that for you? Do you find that I know that when you're with us, you don't see us so often, but you like to just finally switch off from your work and you're amazing at balancing things, you know, or at least now you are. But how important is it for you to surround yourself with, with, with other conductors, musicians, artists? It's something that I miss a little bit. I mean, I have also one of my best friends is, is a musician. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really important to share as well, you know, what we share outside the stage, you know, sports and fun and everything and light themes, not too much about, you know, seriosity. But um, like if we talk about conductors, I still, there's a couple of, of, of people that I look up to, but not that much. Mm, very um, important. And this is, uh, of course, this is missing. You know, I've been learning a lot by myself, with having the chance to be, you know, supported and followed by amazing people, my my teachers and some mentors. But I feel that, um, for example, I had an experience now in December where I was conducting, playing percussion and acting at the same time, wow. which, which was like narrating. It was a piece called L'Histoire du Soldat. And there's, um, there's three roles. There's the soldier, the devil and the narrator. And it's in French. And so there's like a little orchestra where I was playing, conducting, and I was doing the narrator at the same time. It's like 50 minutes of text. So it was a big challenge, you know, and I was with two incredible Portuguese actors. And we worked, it was a totally new world for me. Because, you know, when they ask me to do that um, with my orchestra in my foundation, you know, in Lisbon, I was like immediately, yes, I love challenges. I love risk. And, you know, when you're a conductor, I think you need to love any type of theater, any type of art, which is acting, which is words, which is lights, which is design, costume, anything. And I said, of course, I would like, I would love to, to risk that. Mm. And then arriving at this process of actually, you know, you don't know what you're going to do. It's not like a rehearsal where, you know, I'm used to that. So I was just naked and and learning from them every time they did something different. And I was, okay, it was an incredible experience for me. And I felt, you know, this is going to be maybe in my future, um, something I... 
Uh, that's all we have time for. And uh, no. <laughs> this, no, I, I, I felt really um, conducting will be always, um, uh, you know, my my world, and I would probably do that until the end of my days. But I will not stop only at that. Mm. You know, um, you already know. Sort of, is it is it acting? Is it is it percussion? It's, is it no, it's no, no. I mean, that was just a special combination. But I'm very, very curious. You know, I want to learn about everything and to touch everything. Um, it can be directing. It can be acting. It can be creating. You know. Um, this is you. You know. This is because it's it's just you know. I realized I'm becoming happier and happier when I'm really in that creativity about a moment, about a show. And it's not about having control on everything, but it's to be able to touch all those arts, you know, and to, to relate them with each other. Because it was always my conception of an opera conductor. I was always maybe disturbing somewhat sometimes the director, the light um, uh, manager, the, the costume designer, because I was always like asking, you know, but why do you, did you choose this color of, of, of textile? The, you know, this, um, this role is very like that. So maybe we could add those type of colors or, you know, or, or why this light, you know, this is moment, this music is sounds like that. We should maybe have a light, which is a bit more warm. I mean, I mean, maybe from outside or from the side. And I always felt like, you know, this is, I mean, this is not your responsibility, but it is actually, I think as a conductor, you are, if you really take it deeply on another level, you are the director of the evening. Mm -hmm. So your impact on every little detail, if you love it, if it has an artistic impact about the score, about the music, about the drama, the context, it is important. So... I'm not saying at all, I want to become a director or I want to become an actor. Absolutely not. I'm not a director. I'm not an actor. But I just touched something that made me suddenly boiling my blood again in a new way, you know, because you conduct a lot. So you get a bit not used to it every time, even if every time you try to do different things. But wow, it was very special. I got a new stress, a positive one. I, and I felt... I learned something new. I really step up my my level, my personal level on this challenge. Absolutely. So this is, I think, you know, yeah. what I got, what I want to to continue on on looking for. It's very interesting because I think, yeah, I mean, one of the special things about when you act in a film or in a show uh, or in a play is that whatever your character does you learn about, right? I played a doctor once. I'll never, you know, <laughs> go in there and try to save a life. But I, you, you, you start to learn about this topic, um, you know, or, or you play something else. You really like you dive into that world. I think for me also going behind the camera sometimes, um, seeing how the technical aspects of it work. For, for, it doesn't mean that I want to become uh, a director now for the rest of my life. Uh, same as when I film things, you know, I like to make videography. It doesn't mean I want to be a cinematographer now. But I think that when I get back into acting, you start to add layers to your toolbox. And even as an actor, I think directors or cinematographers will appreciate my sensibility more than because I know what it means to find the light. I know what it means, the pressure of be being a director, the having this umbrella overview of everything, everything they have to juggle. So the more you know, I don't need to be an expert at everything. I think I have my focus, but like, yeah, with different things, just learn little bits and pieces so that you're just familiar, you familiarize yourself with it. I don't have to be, you know, um, like I said, a, a professional at all of these uh, different jobs, but at least be good at it so and be interested exactly. to have so it. Yeah. To have the knowledge. Yeah. Um, and what I, I mean, something that you mentioned earlier is discipline. I think our generation and I include myself hugely in this as well. And, and I think you mentioned the pandemic because there was a way for people even by default to come back to square one, to really take a big breath. Suddenly you realize, okay, I can't do everything that I wanted to do before, all these distractions. I learned, I relearned how to focus myself 
when I approach the work, I am more disciplined. And it could be because there's no fear of missing out. I don't have anywhere to go to parties, but especially I think in the arts, it takes an immense amount of dedication and discipline. What I love about you is that you take the work so seriously, but you don't take yourself too seriously. You know, when we're on a vacation together, we've been on many in our life, um, you are able to let go. You're able to separate the two, and at least from my perspective, and have fun. But when it comes to the work, even if we're on the beach, you know, in Sardinia, and you have your music in front of you, uh, unless there's an emergency, no one can get between you and the page, you and those notes. You are, da, 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 da. you're like your head, you're, you just see you are 150% enveloped into this into this world it's almost like magic you really like are sucked into the page and that is a really important thing i think that's what makes the difference between good and great you know you know that was as a child as well you when i told like i was always very serious about it mm -hmm. it was the you know as soon as there were classical music at home and i was taking a you know a pen and i was beating the beat you know and mm -hmm. People could have lost, and I was in my world completely. When I, and this was, you know, it, it is related as well with sports, I think, as a, I, I wouldn't say as an artist, but as a servant of art, mm. um, you are an athlete yeah. um, completely. So it's simple. If you stop training, and for us, it's much more inside and here. Well, you won't you won't have the right results. And when I we talked before about, you know, maybe a bit of family pressure and like shadows and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I knew from the very very early age, okay, I want to become a conductor. That's a kind of a goal that I have, even if I don't know if I'm made for it, because until you conduct, you don't really know if you are born with this gift, you know. Do you think that's what it is? You, you sorry to interrupt you, but are you, can you learn it or are you no, born with it? You're born with it, definitely. You can learn every technique, you can learn management. You can't learn this natural leadership and this need to, you know, to give and to do it, to, to face every week hundreds of people without fearing their judgment. This is you can't learn, you know, this is really natural. Um, and I realized, okay, to reach this stability, because I had a name already, and I was very young, I look not typical as a classical musician. You know, I did a lot of sports. I love clothes and stuff like that. At the beginning, and well, this is very personal, but because I, I arrive at this stage that I, I'm liberated completely of that, I didn't want to give anything to people to destroy me because I knew there would be jealousy. There would be people because of my name would try to make me fall because of my look, they would try to take me down. So at the beginning, you know, it was very clear in my head that that should never be something that should interfere with, uh, with the development of, of, of myself, mm -hmm. you know, so I didn't let this chance to people which means like clothes wise, I never, you know, went with fancy things because, because I didn't want them to, to, to take that shot against me. Um, so you stripped yourself down to the, the rawest form and you just wanted absolutely. the work to speak for itself. Absolutely. And to analyze, okay, how do I find myself in it? And how do I, you know, play someone? Right. So it was very interesting also to, to see maybe the expectation of people. And then when they saw me, what they thought, you know, because you're very young, you're dealing with a very old business and they are always like all the people in front of you. So with the respect of them, but I still, you are the leader. Until I finally realized um, that yourself proved to the other and especially to yourself that actually now you can be exactly what you are. Mm -hmm. So it's not to have not been hundred percent what I was, but I think this protection, which was very secret because n no one knew it, you know, in a way was fundamental for me to one day bloom completely as I am today. It took a, a, a lot of years. And I think in my personal life was exactly the same. Mm 
You know, when you say like, I was always, you know, I can um, be very different in the holidays. True, but it was very tough for me to also to adapt to a group, to be really completely myself. I was trying to be like you, mm -hmm. to be like my friends, which are not um, confronted every day with that pressure that I was alone confronted to. Mm -hmm. yeah. Until one day I just realized, okay, I think this is the time where you can just be completely what you are. If I want to wear a beautiful clothes, I wear beautiful clothes because I have nothing to be afraid of anymore. How, what did it take? Did it take a certain amount of confidence in your work to say, I have reached a point where I'm confident enough to, where it has nothing to do with my age, right? It's sometimes it's age. When I did my first film, I was 23. I had to tell the editor 45 years of experience exactly the vision I had, right? Without denying his experience to welcome it and to learn from him. But ultimately I had to make a choice. Okay, I'm young, but this is just the way it is right now. And, and I have, do you think for you it was once you got over the fact that you were like the pressure of my father and his, his, his legacy, the pressure of being young, once you felt you were, you have convinced them of your talent, of your, your, your work, that you were able to just be yourself fully? Mm. I think it was much more for myself. Mm -hmm. I never had the need to uh, to reach a state that people would approve what I what 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 I did or that you know talent is something. But yeah, we were born with a gift in my family. But then, what do you make out of it? This is your talent. You know how much work you put into that. I think that's the real talent of using a gift. It was much more in my personal life to to really look at look accept um, because of everything that I lived in my childhood, what I have become, and to accept both, you know, the negative and the positive. To to also be able to to tell you it was good what you have just done, you know, mm -hmm. to realize the quality, to realize as well what you still have to achieve, but not always be constantly in that you can do better, you can do better. Because this is good, but you need sometimes a self-recognition of, you can be proud of, of you, Lorenzo, which is tough. But if you learn how to do that, you can settle down. You reach a step, okay, I accept this moment of, it was good, mm -hmm. but now let's go on. But just this little time, mm -hmm makes you just first reflect on the past. And that's what I mean before pandemic for me was a blessing because I finally realized what I've just done in the past eight years. Uh, but now, okay, I know what is my next step that I have to achieve in my personal life, which will be related to my professional one. Yeah, I think that's a very good point that you bring up. And I think it, it, it's, it's very natural for go-getters and passionate people to look forward and try to achieve the next thing. But how valuable is it to take a look back sometimes and connect the dots, right? And to say, wow, look at what I've achieved and and be take that moment of, of being proud of yourself. Yeah. And it does really fuel you also for the next Absolutely. moment. Um, are there any rituals that you have before you go on, um, like to perform? I, you know, for me, you know, you do... <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's filmed, right? So we saw, <laughs> yeah, they throw a wink out there. Well, the, actually, this is interesting. I have a show in 12 days. Yeah, uh, a new comedy show, which will be very different, I think, because I'm also for the first time, um, and I was very much inspired by Dave Chappelle here, to, to be brave enough to talk about certain serious topics and, and to have a level of depth to it that's not just in... The world of comedy, but really to have moments where I don't need from the first to the last second, make everyone laugh all the time, but really to take a breath and to also without preaching, try to bring my message across. And sometimes it takes a serious note, right? But I told myself uh, for 12 days now, which by the way, is not a very long time for me, uh, no sex. Um, uh, when I'm saying not a very long time, I mean, I, I've gone longer is what I mean. I don't know if that's clear. You just said it. Huh? I know. I know. Don't worry. We'll cut it out. Um, is it for you important to, I, I know that my father had very many problems back in the day when he was performing because he told himself he cannot have distractions. On the other hand, I think it's important to take breaks. It's important to take from real life 
experiences, even during rehearsal phases. And then, I don't know, but, but now I'm getting much more into the phase of, I don't know, <laughs> stay inside, <laughs> lock yourself up. But, but how important is it to, to keep it in the pants? <laughs> You know, this question probably won't make it in, but... Uh, I don't have that... I would not talk an is- as an issue, but uh, no, it doesn't affect me at all. So it's a part of your ritual. Wonderful. No, it's just, you know, <clears throat> I I don't have a ritual. I don't, I don't feel pressure. And um, that's why I think um, that's part of the balance we were talking before. If I have to go on stage, I just go on stage and I feel at home. What I've done before, what I do after, mm-hmm. will never interfere with that. If a day of a very important concert, there's not uh, limited um, like activities that I force myself not do or anything like that. So, no, I, I don't know. I think um, it can be a good experience uh, for you, but... Um, I mean, it's what I tell myself. The reality is it's locked down and there's no one around. Yeah. <laughs> See how, how it reacts. <laughs> Check this one and we'll tell you, if you should have done that. Yeah, probably. <laughs> well, do you think, do you believe in like the show must go on? I know one story where you, I mean, I think you even ripped through a, an appendix or something and you just kept performing. Yeah. It was literally when you said earlier, you saw someone die on stage. Um, this is like what you, without acting, almost experienced. You were, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, I had leading. Like, uh, yeah, my scar was getting. I was getting open. I mean, the the stitches were like because of you know, every movement you do, it was like stretching the the scar that I had. Uh, and you still felt you had to yeah, finish the job. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's okay. Wow. And uh, this is you know this is physical, but I think when you have psychological pain, this is way tougher. This is way, way tougher. And I've been in a situation of losing someone and performing right away or not being able to to be at the funeral of someone of my family because of a concert or, you know, break up, um, mm-hmm. be, being being left the day of a, of a concert, you know, for a long relationship. This is way tougher. Really, because uh, because in a way the show must go on is a is a brutal reality, which I respect. If you cannot do it, absolutely, you know, it's like okay, if you say for that reason I can't do it, I respect it, mm-hmm. and no one can blame you to not be able to do it. But if you think okay, let's take that extraordinary pain, and let's try to make it work for the music, for this moment, then some extraordinary thing can happen, you know, and then you can um, grow from from that. But it's tough. Um, one person told me, you know, no matter what you do, Nadiv, the love of your life will always come in second place to your career, your passion, your this. Dis- somebody. <laughs> I'll send you their number. <laughs> Um, the love of your life will always come second after your passion. Well, well, so they were trying to analyze me and they said, I think one of the issues with um, past relationships for you is that you're so loving, you're so giving, but something that they feel maybe is that the work comes first. Like no matter what, if you have to go to LA for a job, if you have to do this, you go. I have many things to say about that topic. I think number one, if you truly love someone and someone has a deep passion for something, you allow them to blossom, right? Like you, you let them chase their dream. But, and with the pandemic, it took me 0.1 seconds to <laughs> realize that family and love and partnership ultimately comes first, especially in times of need, you know? Like it took me one second to fly from LA back to Vienna to be with the, my loved ones. Um, this, this is a bit of selfish, comfortable excuse. Okay. Why? Because you think that uh, well, I could have... Because of a pandemic, because everything is locked down, because you know that there won't be job anymore. Mm-hmm. It's just, in a way, your comfortable like mm-hmm. issue of pleasing yourself is taking away. Then you go to the second choice, which became first automatically. That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, well, I guess I, I'll never really know. I mean, yeah, things no, were closed down over I there and you have to... Maybe we, in your situation, 
I think you didn't reach yet the state of um, completely freedom in you know in in your passion mm -hmm. in a way to you know you decide what you want to do and stuff like that without having the pressure to of yourself or someone else to to be what you have to become. As soon as you reach, I think, this balanced, then you realize, okay, of course, it's, it's still my passion and I would fly thousands of kilometers to be able to do that. But it will always be, it will never, I mean, to wake up and to think about the person you love will always be the most beautiful thing next to to wake up and to think about what I want to do then, really. I mean... In our cases, we are selfish, or we had to be selfish to achieve whew, a certain know, level. This, yeah, this, this in a way security that we have mm -hmm. now, because that's success, so, right? Success is when you're able to choose this balance. That's freedom. Yeah, this is luxury freedom. for me, completely luxury. Yeah, but I mean, to love someone, I mean, it's the just the best thing. Yeah. And it's, I think like for me, the, the, why I, I, I disagreed with that friend and I agreed to a certain extent because yes, you're right. I am still in a phase. Okay. Maybe the pandemic was not the greatest example. Um, um, but I'm still in the phase where I have to really give it my all. It's such a, people also don't understand what you leave on stage. It's such a vulnerable thing for you with music. For me, when I'm, even when I'm doing an hour show, you leave a part of your soul there. You have to be so open and, and willing to like bear your heart and blood, sweat and tears, you know, sometimes in your case, literally blood, sweat and tears, but it's like, you leave such a big part of it that your mind, your, your energy, your focus needs to be there. It's, it's such a, for me, at least such an important thing, what I'm trying to achieve here. Uh, and yeah, of course, certain distractions can't get in the way of that. My whole theory is that if you love each other strong enough, you support your, each other wherever possible. But the more freedom you have, the more successful you become, the more experience maybe, I think that all, all that happens is your purpose just you know, ad adapts and develops. And, and suddenly it's not just for me in this moment or while I'm still growing or for the audience now, but it's even... I want this for my wife. I want this for my children. I want this on an even bigger scale. And you, you, you need that support. You need a, 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 um, a partner love in order to really blossom, I think, at, at a certain age. Yeah, um, absolutely. But you so have to realize that, okay, without them, as you know, we are, we, we are nothing because you can be as strong as you want by yourself. And because you are used to that, nothing will replace to be with someone. You want to show your muscle? Or I saw that you were doing this and I'm like, I don't know, I'm pale and stuff. And <laughs> I was trying to... <clears throat> Do you want to have like a still moment and looking at each other? Yes. Not to laugh? Not to laugh? Yeah. You think we can do it? You can try. Well, okay. 30 seconds. Let's try. Okay, okay, one more time. Okay, perfect. <laughs> so bad. No, no, no. Oh, okay, thank you. I feel awake now. Um, movement in your piece. Do you feel when you were younger, I feel like it's, it's maybe a typical thing. I don't know. A lot of people listening to this, I'm sure, that are not in the classical world. When they think conductor, maybe they don't have you, unless they know you and they're aware. They picture some old Harry Potter looking like dark arts professor. Yeah. <laughs> the thing. Uh, when you come on with such an energy and such a, although age, maybe it doesn't have something to do with it. Like when I saw Marcel Marceau on stage, he was so alive. And then backstage, he was actually a fragile, older, 80 something year old man. So I think that gets it out of you. But um, do you feel that you, depending on each piece, you you sometimes have to put more of your physicality in and more, because every time I watch you in concert, it's such a, uh, what's the word? It's a visceral experience, you know? And so I like to close my eyes and take in the music, but I, I often can't take my eyes off of you when you're on there because it's such a presence and it's so much uh, alive that you're moving. It doesn't depend on the piece. It really depends on the moment because you have, um, 
you have sometimes slow movements, very, very soft, where actually you need even more tension, you know? It's really about what you feel in that moment and what you feel about the orchestra or the audience and you react of it, you know, if, if you need more tension here, but it has always to do with the music you're conducting right now. I think you have a lot of conductors, which for me are in a way not real conductors because the movement they do has no impact on the sound. So what you see actually, any type of movement has to have an impact of the, on the tension and on the sound. If not, it's just a show for, for the public, you know, to, you, it's very easy to do big movements and oh, everyone is like that. But uh, you can have people who are moving so much and, and it's flat, you know. Mm -hmm. And as you said, some people are not moving a lot, but manage to get the tension and, and you can't breathe. Yeah. So it's, it's really, it's a matter of, of your personality of, you know, how, if you want to just use the hand, the arm or the entire body or, it really depends. But it depends in the moment and in the music, but do you sometimes, if you experience something in real life, and you're working on, I don't know, a Tchaikovsky or, you know, my favorite piece is, what is it? Prokofiev, the Romeo and Juliet. I was trying to think if I saw you ever do that. Uh, you didn't. No, you've but you've done it. Um, if you're experiencing something in your personal life, you know, you have an argument, a fight, this, and you feel it fits in the moment. Do you use it as a part of your experience to get, get that feeling across more? Or do you try to separate it and say... No, absolutely. It's, I mean, everything is related, but, uh, but you know, I mean, that's why my profession is extraordinary because there's never an end. You can do this piece, Prokofiev, at the age of 25 years old. And while you do it, you have a trouble with someone and you, you, that actually give you in, in a way like food mm -hmm. to get imagination, to get physical attention. Five years later, maybe you are in the most beautiful time in your life, but you will have a stronger impact because actually you didn't mix your personal thing with the music. Yeah. So it's, it can be good but, and also not good. So it's, sure. it really, it really depends. But of course, if you know sorrow, if you know happiness, if you know ecstatic emotions and all of that, personally, if you lived that, then your spectrum of possibility of sharing it without words is of course bigger. And then you can, okay, you can conduct a Mahler symphony. You can conduct a uh, Schubert Unvollendete because you know what, what the composer wants to say because he was in the same situation as you. So you can identify those emotions and then you can transmit it, mm -hmm. of course, easily because you can feel it and, and you don't have to, to lie, you don't have to hide. You know, so you have to be vulnerable yourself to be able to give to the musician the possibility to play vulnerable to the audience. So the audience feel the same. Yeah, I think that's what they mean with like you're naked on stage, really. And you're so open for and also you feel immediately. I can imagine the reaction of an audience, you know, and whether it's the judgment, whether it's wow, is something new, you but stage, you know. immediately. Right. It's something that I um it's, uh, I'm starting to also understand why you meant earlier, how important it is to stay in a feeling, whether it's sorrow, this, that, because otherwise, how else can you connect it yeah. with your work? And otherwise just work just becomes routine, routine and blah, blah. And then there's uh, many other people that can do it. The difference between good and great, you know, the difference between being famous or being a star. Mm -hmm. It's like, I think that that takes development to really be able to, to, yeah. What is famous for you? I think, you know, a lot of people confuse what I do with, oh, well, he's not famous yet. Oh, he hasn't made it yet. Or, or he doesn't. And if I want to be famous, I'll run butt naked uh, across the street five times. In Austria, they'll definitely pick that up in the press. And that's famous. I can be famous off of one viral video, maybe, you know. That's not the goal for me. The only reason why I think, why I strive for recognition in my work is because I'll have more freedom of choice with the work that I want to do. You think like I can always choose, right? But it's not true. Right now I can choose between uh, playing uh, Shady Doctor number two <laughs> or a student short film. Eventually you'll be able to really choose work that really speaks to you. Um, and that's what I mean with becoming 
known. I don't like to use the word famous because again, anyone nowadays can become famous, especially with how quick things go. You know, you make a TikTok video, boom, you're out there. But does that last? I think the the yeah, what makes it harder is not to do it, but to do it again. Compared to who? Exactly, and 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 that's just like you said. You can't learn. You can learn techniques how to become a conductor, but you cannot teach someone how to just be at a certain level. How, you just have it in you. It's in your genes. It's in your blood. Mm-hmm. Um, and I feel that way too. And I feel being a star is just you don't have to be famous to be a star. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Certain people just have a, a presence. When you walk into a room, I met Tom Cruise, regardless of how he is in his personal life. I, I met him on, on a couple of occasions. Each time he walks in the room and I, I promise you, even if he wouldn't be the superstar that he is today, the room would be quiet. He has such an immense presence and you know, he's rather small and you feel like you're in the room with a giant. That's something that I strive for, but you can't learn that. It's just, you have it in you, you have it not, and you don't use it to intimidate people. It's just something that people feel. And hopefully through it, you can inspire. Hopefully through it, you can connect people, you know? This is this is what I mean by it. And it's, it's yeah, when you said each time, depending on where you are in your life, the piece will be different. You can do Prokofiev a hundred different times. Um, the same as if you do a Hamlet. That's why I love certain pieces that are written, not so much the modern ones, but like take a Shakespeare. It's so brilliant, the writing, because any actor that does it, it will automatically be different. Any director that directs it will have a different interpretation. The only thing that also interests me is when you study a piece of music, do you also go into the research of, I mean, I'm sure you do it's such a, almost a primitive question, but like, do you research the conductor? What was this, uh, not the conductor, sorry, the composer. Um, what was he or she thinking at the time? Like, what was the political situation? You know, what was the, that all has a, has a lot to do with it, no? How you... knowledge is very important to try to understand why he composed that piece, you know? Mm-hmm. So yeah, we mm. do that all the time. Do you think also, um, and I'm being aware of the time, yeah, perfect. We're just coming to an end here. Um, passion, yes. Um, dedication, I think that you've had to deal a lot with compromise also as a young person doing what you do, that you don't always have time to be with your friends. You have to often live out of a suitcase from hotel to hotel. When uh, younger people or or I guess um, people ask you advice in the industry, people ask you, you know, what does it take? What is this? Do you feel that if you're not madly in love with this, then it's not for you because of the sacrifice you have to make? Absolutely. You can't do that if it's not a necessity. It's, if you first, if you don't accept sometimes loneliness, if you don't, if you can't live like that, it's a choice, you know. I could stay in one city, of course, but I took the choice when I started to go the other way because I needed that to to grow. And it's, uh, yeah, it's sacrifices. I, I don't like to use this word because it's it sounds negative. Right. In my case, you know, yeah, it's just... Circumstances. Yeah, it's just part of, you know, it's the other side of the coin. But it's extraordinary for me. I mean, it's it's a luxury life because I decided yeah. where I want to go. I, I'm in great cities. I, I share emotion with so many people around the world. Mm-hmm. And outside of that, I have a lot of free time where I, of course, I do a lot of sports, I study a lot, but still I have time uh, to take an airplane just at six in the morning to uh, breakfast with a friend somewhere and going back. This luxury, I think it's, um, of course, is a result of a lot of hours of work and discipline. But at the end, um, yeah, I think people sometimes are are scared. Mm-hmm. Because uh, because it's exhausting, because you spend a lot of time with yourself. I probably have lunch and dinner by myself 300, year, 300 days a year. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but I think it's great. And it's a beautiful obsession at the end of the day. It's your, 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 you, you live and breathe for it in many moments, and, you know? And you realize that I can live alone. Yeah, because there's a big difference between... Now to live with someone. Right. I don't know. Right. But uh, I can live without my phone for, I can be at a subway station and just stay still and look around myself and not being constantly saved 
from this immobility by by Instagram or something like that. Right. Yeah, I sometimes call you when you're on the road or when I'm working on a new project because what I, where I draw inspiration from you, I think we're similar in the sense that we don't necessarily have heroes, but we are inspired by people. You know, we... we um, Maybe it's because our fathers, I don't know, already from birth, you kind of don't even have a choice, right? You're born into a certain feeling and you can use it as pressure or living in a shadow or you can take it as inspiration and then just go your own path. It's something we spoke a little bit about earlier. Yeah. But I think it's also, you know, it can go the t totally different way. You can be also like completely uh, against, against that. Absolutely. Yes. Maybe it's the way you're raised. Maybe it's an experience that you had. You know, we were lucky with positive experiences of, of what... Freedom. We were lucky freedom. with freedom and, of course, be able to, you know, to choose what we wanted to choose with the support of it. And that they were there, right? Like, my dad could be on tour for months, but if I needed him in something urgent, even if it's on the phone, he's there, yeah. you know? Um, but with you, and I'll end it on this before I compliment, shower you in compliments, um... The difference between being alone and feeling lonely. Mm -hmm. It takes experience. Mm -hmm. I, I, just like you, I, I love sometimes being on my own, but it doesn't happen often that I feel lonely. If I ever feel lonely, I feel that I'm not being understood. If I'm going through something and that no one can relate to what I'm going through, then it really takes the work to, to, to dig deep by yourself, but, and to rely on yourself. But being alone is often a beautiful thing. For me, it's, it's my everyday reality to be alone. Um, and to be lonely, I think it's a very important feeling because, I mean, I've been very lonely and I wanted to stay there. You know, it's, mm -hmm. I have sometimes a tendency to like sorrow, to feel at home with that f emotion and, and to push myself to be more lonely. I also new in a way, like a bit of feeling of depression uh, in certain moments of my life. Um, well, I ask really my friends and my family, I can't have contact with you. I, I need to stay in that state and to raise by myself. But I realize, yeah, you need, you need, you need people around. Oh, it's, yeah. it's, it's much, life is much more beautiful with people around than to, with yourself. If you're able to, that's why I said not to dwell too long in a feeling, but to then be able to reach out for support when you really, when the time comes. But I'm starting to do that too, to say, look, I don't want to be, you know, I want to be on my own a little bit and lonely. I mean, sometimes in the summer when I was going through this phase of depression, I felt very lonely, even though I was surrounded by all my friends. It's a state of mind, right? It's sometimes, but I think it's, Talking again about purpose, because you said sometimes you like the feeling of, of, of sadness, of darkness, the sorrow, because I think it also let, allows you to connect it to the work that then connects to thousands of people. Yeah, absolutely. And you help people that way, you know? Lorenzo Viotti, uh, Lore, Lore, Lore. What do I always say? Lore, Lore. No, no, I forget now. On WhatsApp, I always do something. Lore, Lore, Lore. Yeah, Lore, 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 Lore. You know what? It's something else, but it's, um, something, else. it's something else. I like it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's very new, Italian. It's very Italian. Um, I have a tradition that I end my podcast uh, with saying three things that I really appreciate about the person sitting in front of me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is really funny. <laughs> wow. This is so malcho. It's so malcho. We do it at every birthday. And you know, sometimes you should look in the mirror and do it to yourself as well. You know, it's important to, like you said, take the moment to say, hey, I'm proud of myself. How many times a week do you do that? Uh, I do it around 30, 40 times a week. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And there's nothing negative about me, which is the, the greatest thing ever. I know. That's you know? my friend. Yeah, I know. Because I'm perfect. Yeah. Perfect. So for you, um, I think that your passion electrifies. And like you said at the beginning, um, at the start of our podcast, that... Um, you use me and we were laughing about it but I actually I do I draw in a positive sense I really draw inspiration from you I soak it up like a sponge I think age has nothing to do with it because we're the same age more or less I think but your experience exceeds mine and I feel always and eternally inspired by by what you do and the energy that 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 sh you know Exu exudes out of you. That's not a word, but I think it feels right. It feels right. Yeah. It feels right. Um, you're a very loyal friend. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and what I really appreciate about you is that you call people out when we're not being there for you. I've seen you do it with, again, I'm perfect. I've seen you do it with, uh, you know, <laughs> my brother Ilan or Marcello. Um, yeah, when they're not there, uh, it's okay, but you're not just going to ignore things. You really, you know, put things to the test, you, 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 you're not afraid of conflict and it never feels like it's coming from an aggressive or negative place. It's always coming from a place of love and you see, you, you feel the importance for you of loyalty and friendship um, and that how, how, how important it is to rely on that. And I really, really learned a lot about friendship and loyalty through you, you know? Um, and, and yeah, something I mentioned before is uh, that you take... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you think I'm going to say something else. <laughs> Lorenzo, there's no secret here. You're an athletic, beautiful man. I, um, I appreciate your, your, your look and feel, your chiseledness and your, um, your strong sense of, uh, of, of humor yeah. and your large... Um, in French, right? Ah, in French, it's it's incredible. It's incredible. Incredible, exactly. Um, and of course, you have a huge... Um, uh, wonderful heart, you know, and it's, it's, it's strong, you know, and it's, uh, and it's shaped in a way that, uh, and we're going to cut here. Uh, Lorenzo, thank you. So we should. Oh, <laughs> oh, how is it? Alexa, who is Lorenzo Viotti? Here's something I found on the web. According to us today.com. Flemish broadcaster VRT is host broadcaster for the International Junior Eurovision Song Contest 2005. <laughs> well, Lotte, you're famous to me. <laughs> Flemish. Alexa, does Lorenzo Vialto have a huge... A Alexa, cut. Cut. Personality. I already answered that. Lotte? I don't know that one. <laughs> Fantastic. You're going to find this out. Your, your, your side of loneliness. Yeah, I'm never really lonely. You have a woman talking to you. How do you think I work on my... Hey, Alexa, tell me a joke. What's the opposite of irony? Wrinkly. <laughs> <laughs> thank you and thank you, Lore, uh, for being here. Thank much so love. Much. Thank you, my friend. Ciao. All right, that was pretty good. We didn't beatbox, but... Yeah, but maybe you can add the, the, the singer of the beginning. Oh, I will. And you, and you. Oh, love you. Jokes is out. That was another episode of Jokes is